Good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar. I'm Dave. Hi there. My name is Ivar. Welcome. Right. So today we have an interesting topic, topic around base array deployments. Uh, before we dive into that, I would like to highlight or mention that uh, during the webinar you can leave questions in the Q&A tab. So please feel free to do that and I will be happy to answer them at the mm -hmm. end of the webinar. That being said, Ivar, uh, base array deployments. Yeah. Yeah, today we have uh, our specialist in uh, in Sweden, uh, uh, Jürgen from Sweden. Hi, Jürgen. Hi there. Please introduce yourself a bit. Maybe uh, people have already seen you in a previous webinar, maybe, but uh, it's always good. You you have quite some experience in base race, right? Well, well, yeah. I mean, the, we we started here at Bose for many years ago, and I started to work here in '94 uh, as a sound system designer, and so doing church and stadium and helping rental partners to do their concert tours uh, with the sound. Yeah, you're our expert in bass arrays, uh, we can say. Uh, <laughs> that being said, uh, uh, I think it's good. It, 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 let's say the stage is yours, uh, Jürgen. So um, are you ready, uh, Jürgen? Sure. I, um, I found a few photographs of different bass arrays type from the early days, and, and as far as I know, one of the earliest designs that we have done here both was a J-Ray at uh, Heisel Stadium in Belgium, installed in 1995. Uh, if you look really carefully behind the horn, you can see the, the J-shape. Uh, it's a dual 18-inch um, subwoofers. Uh, moving on, uh, two years later, uh, I found a real example of a uh, for a live tour in Sweden in 1997, where two six meters and fires were flying under the stage ceiling. Uh, moving on to 2003, I found an early example of a compound array uh, in an ice hockey arena, arena also in Sweden. And one of the last examples for this is a ring array that was installed in uh, in Sweden in 2008. So all the subs are are mounted or installed in a in a ring in the middle of the cluster there. Um, all these comes from uh, an internal handbook written in 1998 by Chris Ickler from Acoustic Research here about who also became our mentor regards base arrays, uh, actually until recently. And fun enough, there are features described in this handbook that is still not fully explored. Um, in 2001, we filed a patent called Modular Base um, Raying uh, that was later granted in 2004. So that's a little bit how it started and what different types we're usually working with. Let's move on to present time. And, and since many years back, I think the majority in the, in the pro sound industry knows what a base array is. Uh, I've been watching many fantastic webinars lately describing how it works and even some great experimental new array configurations. And it's, it's really a wonderful time uh, when so many people share their work. So uh, we decided to show you a use case instead of the theory behind it. And um, I will use ease focus. It's, it's so easy to use. And, and, um, but we will start uh, with a place to put a sound system in. The easiest way to do this when there is an outdoor gig is to use Google Maps. And uh, this is uh, downtown Gothenburg in Sweden. And uh, in the middle of the town, there is a special place where they used to have concerts uh, on this grass field. Uh, usually the stage is located here and the audience area is this grass field uh, in front of the stage there. As we're going to use is focus, it's easier when this uh, stage is uh, at the left of the window on your computer and the speakers are pointed to the right. Now there's a function in Google Map. If you click on this little globe here, you will get a compass. And with that compass, if you click and hold uh, your mouse and just drag it, uh, the drawings will rotate. And 
doing that is becomes much easier to use that in ease focus. The next thing you want to do is to measure a distance so we can transfer this image to a drawing by right clicking and say measure distance. And um, the first click is the back of the room and then where it says zero if you just drag that to the front of the stage where you think it's going to be located and I think it's going to be located somewhere here. Um, I can still see that my image is a little bit not straight. So this is uh, probably easier to work with. It's now a straight in the horizontal and we have measurements of 50 meter from the front of the stage to the back of the uh, audience area. When this is done, we can use it as a drawing uh, by the simplest way is to do a screen capture. I'm using something called Snagit. You can use whatever you want and then you just save it as, a, as an image. And the next thing is to import that into Ease Focus. So I have launched Ease Focus and I'm running the version um, 3.1.11 for your reference. So in here, the first thing we're going to do is to um, insert the drawing. And uh, when that is done, we need to scale it and set it to a reference point. And that will be at the front of the stage where we position the uh, point A. And point A will also be on X0 and Y0. So that is straight in the middle of the stage. And we also know from the measurement we took in Google Maps that the distance uh, from point A to point B is 50 meters. When that is done, uh, we have transferred our uh, image to a drawing that is actually scaled. Uh, the next thing is to actually remove this first surface that is automatically inserted when you launch a program. And we will use another one. Uh, this one, which we will position at to be in the front of the stage. So that will be X and, and Y zero. We know from the measurement that is the depth of it is 50 meters, the through distance for the sound system. And we will also just make it a little bit bigger and we will actually adjust these handles later on. The stage uh, will be a stage line, probably an SL260, which is about, as far as I can remember, it's about 10 meters wide uh, versus 7 meters deep. And of course, it's going to be positioned at X0 and Y0. I know that they, if you hoist it as maximum, will be 1.6 meters. And if we want to do some calculation on the stage, uh, the musicians will, of course, be standing. And actually, I forgot to do that with the audience area as well. Right now, they are sitting. And uh, we will calculate for standing people. So when this is done, we have a playground, more or less. Uh, the next thing is to insert a sound system by clicking on the sound source. And uh, we're going to use Showmatch from Bose, uh, which is a rental system. And um, it's going to be positioned at X0. Uh, y, the stage is about 10 meters on the stage floor, so about five and a half. Um, that will just make room for that. Uh, the distance on the hanging point on the SL260, I believe, is 7.9 meters uh, minus the chain motor so the maximum height will then be yeah 74 that's that's pretty well good uh, the system has a throw distance of 50 meters and it's going to be used for pop rock music so i will be using a 12 box array to do this now when it comes to the um, system 
uh, with show match they comes in a couple of different carts or transportation carts uh, there is a long throw and there is a medium throw and there is a downfield cart uh, contains four modules in each so obviously in the far field i will be using the uh, the sm5 which is a five degrees vertical uh, with a 55 degrees horizontal waveguide and uh, that is a far throw so the first four module comes from that transportation card and we'll do the far throw and then in the middle part of the room uh, audience arrow so this is this part here uh, this next section we will be using an sm5 so still five degrees vertical but with a 70 degrees horizontal waveguide and they are transported in a cart with four of them the downfield uh, we will be using 100 degrees uh, in all and in the bottom there is an SM10, so 10 degrees vertical and 100, and a 20 degrees vertical and 100 degrees uh, waveguide. So that's the system. Uh, the next thing is to um, name it, so we can have um, good use for it. So this will be main stage, oh, sorry, stage left, uh, and the rigging will be. Um, that little one they call it's a kind of a T bar instead of the full frame. So let's splay it. Uh, I'm using the auto splay as a good starting function with the conventional algorithm. And of course the target area is the is just the main areas. When that is done, he has managed to find uh, splay angles and pitch. Uh, looking at the uh, A-wedged broadband, uh, this is a level, and as you can see, the slope is pretty okay. Um, you may want to tweak a few splay angles in between here, manually maybe, but in general I would say this is a really good starting point. So this is the main stage left. All the filter settings we will be using here is uh, at the crossover of 65 Hertz. So the um, next thing is actually just to copy and put a, a second one, stage right, which will be located on, on X0 and minus five and a half. And of course, this is, will be our stage right. There we go, then we have a left and right system. And it's time to um, insert the sub system. So I'm gonna use a sub array and position them in the center. Now, as you can see, they ended up under the stage. Uh, so I will actually move them to X1. And because in the front of the stage, there will be an area where people uh, can't be and uh, maybe there are some evacuation area here and so let's actually do that right away so we're going to take a like a two meter off the audience area that will probably match that, that reality anyway back to the subsystem so uh, the number of subunits is going to be equal to the number of full range model on each side. Uh, so let's do that. We have the 12 full range modules. So I will use 12 and we had two of them. So I will stack two subs. So in total, I have 24 subwoofer modules. Um, the spacing right now is one meter. And that kind of ended up nicely because they ends where the main array is. The next question is to find a proper coverage angle. And it can be a little bit dif difficult if we look at it uh, by first turning off uh, left and right. And just looking at the sub and we select uh, the 63 octave and turn on the mapping and I guess I need to choose uh, a lower 
uh, resolution in order to speed it up a little bit. So <clears throat> right now it is at 77. Should it be at, you know, 50, so less delay on the corner, so the coverage is 50, should it be on <clears throat> 60? And in order to find um, the right coverage angle, <clears throat> I prefer to use one uh, method, and that is to find this minus 60 dB point of the main array instead. So to find that, you know, the, the, the 60B, minus 60 dB point is, is usually where you put a delay tower or something like that, a fill speaker in, in one another way. So knowing where the minus 60 dB point of the entire coverage uh, or the entire seating area is really handful because then we can match the distribution um, <clears throat> of that. So let's turn off the sub and turn on the left and right. Switch to a wedge broadband um, and just look for that point. Um, so if we start in the back of the room, we can see that in the area here we have 105 dB. So the position you should look for at now is in the left corner, bottom corner, right here. So when I move the mouse up again, you can see the level of the system. So we are running at 160 dB in the middle. That means that the uh, uh, the minus 60 dB point should be roughly at 100. And actually I managed to position that uh, handle right actually that it was 100. So that's accidentally was good. Uh, <clears throat> the next one if you look in the middle it says 111 dB, 112 in the middle. So we are looking for 104 dB if we just move to the side. 106, 105. Okay, so we're a little bit too wide. If we move on to the front, um, 112, so 104, okay. So we should probably be able to squeeze that in a little bit and search for 104. Okay, and moving to the middle again, 112 and straight up 104. Okay, so looking at this map, uh, we probably have shaped the audience area where everything is in um, plus and minus 3 dB. So at the distribution, this is probably, uh, if we set it to a 60 dB class width, uh, right now we have about a 50% of coverage within the 60 dB class range. Now, this will change if we move up to um, a medium mapping resolution this might change a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> and it did, uh, it moved up to 56%. So if we uh, remember 56 and use that as a target to um, um, match the subwoofer um, coverage, I think we have a system that is kind of in, in good tonal balance. So let's turn off uh, the main system, turn on the subwoofer and we'll get rid of the a weighted filter and just looking at 63 hertz octave. Now we can see that the um, 6 dB width or the plus minus 3 dB, uh, the coverage at the 63 by done by the subwoofer is 50 uh, percent coverage. So we need a little more spreading than that. So let's start with 65 of the coverage angle. And that ended up as 51. So closing up 70. And you can see all these delay angles are changing. So it's uh, 
spreading the energy better. 53 percent, 75, and I will continue doing this until I hit the 56 uh, percentage. 54, 80. Uh, let's see what I end up with. 55.6. We're very close. Uh, maybe 80 was the best option. Let's see what this ends up with. 56, almost on the same number. So that is how I do it when it comes to matching the coverage of the subwoofers. So I know that the, the, the spreading is, uh, in is the same in the sub range as it is in the full range range. So we have 56% of from the main system. Uh, and we have 56% from the subsystem. So the next question is, what if we combine them? What will then happen? Uh, so let's turn them on. And the result when they are turned on is that it actually became less. Uh, we're down to 49%. And that's probably due to alignment of the main and subsystem. So, alignment. Um, I have just made a new simple uh, ease, uh, ease design here uh, with the main. Just a few modules and a stack and a position about 20 meters away. So, looking at alignment, what's, what's happening? Um, it's a lot of discussions around the world how to measure and predict and what alignment actually it is. But you kind of you can think of it as beam steering. Uh, alignment and beam steering is kind of the same thing. When you're looking at um, the third octave at the crossover point between the main system and the sub, uh, this in this case it's 63 hertz, you see that there's a buildup, a summation right in the middle of the main and the subsystem. So this is the beam. And that beam is actually uh, uh, where the highest SPL in the frequency is. And the, uh, the purpose is to aim that beam down to the listeners, to the audience. It's kind of a pointing a speaker, exactly like this speaker. It's uh, in between the, the main and the low. So one way to do it is to delay one of the pieces. If you delay the main system, this beam will steer up. We can just show you that. So if we go to the main system and um, delay that a little bit, let's say one degree, uh, sorry, one milliseconds or two, you can see that the lobe or the beam is starting to pointing upwards. Uh, if there is somebody sitting up here, good for him, bad for the others. So let's swing that back. So the beam always turn to this component that you are delaying. And we want to have the beam down to the audience area. That means that we need to switch to the sub and start delay the sub. Um, so I want you to look at two things. Uh, one thing is the beam, which is of course now straight out here and the frequency response at that position, and that is position number one. You can see the level here. So when the beam starts to hit the listening position, you should see something happening here at the level. So that's just one millisecond. Uh, the beam started to tilt a little bit down. Two, you can see it starts rising at 80 hertz, and the beam is probably slightly above him. So let's add another millisecond. Uh, looks like the wave front is really hitting him. Let's see if we can optimize it a little bit. Uh, just look at the frequency response while I'm adding four millisecond. Uh, <clears throat> right now he's probably slightly under. So let's say three and a half. Yeah, that added a tiny piece of 
extra energy at 63 hertz and you can see that the wavefront is actually hitting him so aligning main and subsystem at least in my perspective is nothing else than just beam steering and you need to delay the components in order to steer the beam to the audience area so let's switch back to this design here and uh, we can see here at 63 hertz one octave we have three beams there's one beam pointing upward and there's one beam in the center but that's how it looks on the uh, top view let's look at the side view and um, i selected the sub woofers the array that means that the side view is showing me the um, vertical uh, distribution and as you can see there is one beam going straight not straight uh, it's going upward at least uh, so we are playing for the birds uh, and we're missing the audience uh, with that beam at least if we switch over to uh, I just made a line here um, we can see that this beam is not pointing upward it's pointing downward uh, it's really close to a kind of a perfect pitch of that beam so it would be nice if we can only uh, adjust this beam uh, pitching that down but we can't so we have to find a good balance between those two beams uh, in order to coverage and maximize the coverage so switching over to distribution graph we have this 49.8 uh, we know from the vertical beam uh, that they are pointing upward that means that we need to delay the subwoofer if we want the beam to be steered down so let's start by adding one millisecond to the uh, base array the broadside array and um, from the picture it became a little louder on the main beam and we increased to 50.3 so let's add another 51.5 and you can kind of see that this beam uh, is actually increasing in strength let's add another 52.6 and now it actually looks like we are stealing energy probably these beams here are going you know they're becoming more pitched and more pitched the more we are delaying the sub array so somewhere here we are going to steal too much of those beams and put that into the main beam in the middle and that's what just happened so we decreased the distribution down to 50.7 at 4 milliseconds so let's back up to or sorry let's switch back to the 3 so this is the highest number we can achieve um, 52.6 now in order to double check this and see if this is correct that we have took the right decisions I put in some listeners so if we switch over to um, frequency response and to have a better resolution we need to switch over to third octave and if we go back to zero and um, just look at these frequency response so these are all these positions here and what we could expect uh, if we are doing the right thing here if we are delaying the right component we should have higher SPL in the crossover bandpass so let's go from 0 to 1 okay more or less all of them increased so we are doing something right at least 2 major part of them increased there was a 1 or 2 that decreased 3 all these guys uh, were actually increasing four millisecond now there was a med there was a lot of them that decreased so by just clicking on these ones sorry uh, on just looking at the frequency response I would say that probably the highest number the highest SPL in the crossover uh, bandpass is probably three milliseconds so that's my conclusion that if the subsystems are located perfectly there and the mains are hanging right there um, a three millisecond delay is a good starting point 
then I do the rest uh, by measuring or by just listening. Now, what if the production tells us that they want to have much more people in the audience? They are going to open the stage side walls so people can be standing over here and looking into the stage. Um, so for that you need, you know, outfills and you need the sub to cover a much, much wider area. So let's do that. Um, first of all, uh, we need another area, audience area, that's for sure. So like they do on TV, I prepared a little bit. I um, made this audience area much bigger and I added uh, outfills to the systems. So they are covering this whole side sections. Uh, looking at the coverage, um, and now I've turned off the sub, so this is just the direct uh, A-wedged broadband. And looking at the distribution, we have a 73% within the uh, 60B class width. So that's kind of our target, 73% to try to figure out a good coverage from the subsystems. So first approach is to use uh, left and right end fires. So I positioned four uh, triple stacks uh, after each other and laid them uh, according to uh, a nice end fire. And they are pointing straight out into the audience area. The distribution is uh, if you click on it, it says 40.5%. So that is the coverage and, and we had 73. So seems like we have a long way to go. By yawing end fires. So now they are yaw outward. And I play with the yaw angles in order to improve uh, the coverage and the uh, the numbers that I ended up with to be having the highest coverage or distribution here uh, is when they are yawed 50, 54, uh, sorry, um, 45 degrees outward. But still, it's just 53% uh, uh, within the 60 bit class width. So let's try another trick. So this time, the uh, I have stepped the end fires. So that means that the, this is a, a row of uh, just stacked because I, I wanted to keep the number of subs uh, close to each example. So there are four in a row stacked, and then there is another four in a row, and they are using the same um, delay times. But as these fours are positioned backward from the front of the stage, you can see that the energy, uh, the beam is going in this direction. And the idea is to, same as when you draw the entire end fire, is to uh, make the whole system a little bit more directive and have a um, less overlap. So with this stepped array, we achieved a 46.8, uh, which is better than the yaw and fire solution. So here is a vortex. Uh, if I zoom in on the, the ones, you see the stacks are one pointing forward uh, to the side and to the other side. And this one, uh, that little one, he is uh, polarity reversed and he is also delayed in order to maximize uh, the power at least in position one here, and also cancellate uh, to the on the, to this stage. It's called a vortex, uh, and the result is actually is worse than the uh, stepped end fire. So we are down to 39 now. Hmm. Uh, the last attempt I want to try is to see if we can spread the broadside, the center broadside array improved and, and see if we can find anything better than the 44% which was the step array. So here is the broad side uh, as we used before but with this new bigger um, audience area and it's still on 85 as we left it before and 
it's actually better than the left right solutions already by almost 10 percent so let's see if we can improve this a little bit uh, let's do it in big chunks here uh, 110 and we have a um, distribution of already 60. wow so this is much better let's step up to 130 degrees and see if we can beat 60 uh, in any way it's calculating and there is 62.3 now that's impressive um, another way to i think this is probably the maximum if we just for the sake of it uh, increase it to 150. i think we are going to lose a lot of low you know, long throw capability and uh, yeah we actually lost a few percent so the maximum or the most even coverage is 130 degrees uh, which gave us a number of 62.3 uh, the next thing you could do uh, is also squeezing and changing the spacing so now it's still on one meter if we squeeze them a little bit into 0.9 instead so remember 62.3 um, this could result in a little little change yeah so minor change into distribution looking at the levels at the side here so you remember that you should look here in the left corner uh, 104 db and in the far back 160 db so that's pretty well it's only 2 db difference of a 50 meter throw distance compared to a um, much smaller i think the length of this one is 17 meters um, plus uh, a few extra meters from the sub so a really nice uh, coverage i would say uh, do remember when you are playing with the um, spacing of the systems um, is that if you squeeze them too close to each other then all, all of a sudden uh, they will start act um, differently i would say uh, if you want to read more about that there is an article called mind the gap um, there is two parts of it that describes this phenomenon much much in more depth uh, very interesting reading right now if you hold your uh, shift key in ease focus then you have a tape measurement and you can measure the distance in between the boxes with a 0.9 uh, meter spacing you have uh, 20 centimeters or 0.2 meters in between the boxes and you could play the minimum uh, and this is very unscientific would be 15 centimeters you should not uh, have a smaller gap than that to my experience at least um, so read those articles and do mind the gaps um, do not make them closer than 15 centimeters however uh, with the 63.1 is probably the best coverage that i could achieve uh, it's only two deep difference from the side to the far back um, and I think this concludes um, this wide coverage this wide audience area with probably the, the most even uh, low frequency distribution so that concludes this session Ivar and uh, Dave are you there yes we are uh, Jürgen Thank you for this uh, really detailed explanation. Uh, really interesting. And um, we're going to check if there are any questions. So feel free. Um, do we have any questions? David? So I don't see any. <laughs> I, in the meantime, I was able to answer one of the questions so that I already moved to answers. Yeah. Um, so I what on your end? Yeah, some private questions. We got okay. some. So please, if you have a question, uh, put them in the Q&A. And I've got some private questions here. <laughs> So we do got questions, uh, Jürgen. How do the hey. techniques shown in the presentation uh, translate to uh, indoor use? 
Okay. Uh, well, for indoor, I would say it's both easier and more difficult. Um, it's easier as the uh, reflection will help filling out the uh, the gaps. Um, uh, even that is from the diffuse field. Um, so that enables you to use left right subs and have the, still a good coverage with all that benefits. But at the same time, it's also more difficult, I would say, uh, because uh, directivity becomes a key component to sound quality due to the often longer reverberation times in the sub range. So my kind of go to uh, design is a deep and uh, deep end fire at each side of the stage for indoor use. Okay, thank you. One more. Um, do you have a go-to, let's say, uh, array deployment that you that usually works for an in uh, for an outdoor environment? So as a sort of rule of thumb, or is there maybe anything that you would not recommend for outdoor use? Um, well, I mean, left right creates a tight sound due to the shorter impulse responses. Uh, as all sub signals arrives in a shorter time frame, that also left right creates a uh, frequency dependent streets uh, with usually a drop off uh, minus 20, as we can see in the in the in the presentation there. Um, using um, a broadside uh, when that is correct deployed, it could be cover without any drops, but the penalty is a change in frequency response and also a loss in tightness. So. I would like to think what is the best for the audience? Um, mm -hmm. A little untied sub for all uh, or a tight sub but different frequency response for all. So I my go-to would probably be thinking about the best for the audience and I think that is having sub to all people even that it's not that uh, tight as it would be in the left right. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, maybe related to the next question that I have, would you always design uh, the array to make the low frequencies equally loud everywhere uh, or uh, deliberately less for the audience in the back of the... Uh, uh, okay, area? yeah, it, it might look like, like that in the presentation, but Amy, you know, in the perfect world, I would like to design for a constant frequency response throughout the audience area, but that is not so easy, especially when the subs are ground stacked on the on the ground. Uh, usually the uh, mid-high would get a natural distance drop while the sub will drop more aggressively. Um, in a few occasions I actually added delay subs arrays in the back of audience to um, uh, maintain their tonal balance. So I would say maintaining tonal balance is what I think is the goal, uh, yeah. not looking too much to the uh, levels Getting the tonal balance is what I think it's is the optimum goal. Yeah, this is also personal, of course, but yeah. yeah. Do you get some yeah, questions? Yes, so we, uh, we have two questions popped in. So mm -hmm. one from uh, Winston: uh, How accurate are these predictions when you get out into the field? Well, um, as I said, um, the prediction only works if the system are positioned as they are in the simulation. Um, for whenever, whatever reason they are moved due to um, you know security or something else that is moving or you have something wrong. Um, when I have compared, uh, using these focus, compare the results, uh, the alignment time and, and such a things to um, a real world when they are positioned as it is, it matches extremely well. I would say that is in the, in the, in a millisecond correctly. Um, it's due to at Bose, we have a, a long legacy of measuring speakers for simulation softwares, and we use the same methods, even if it's our in-house software called Modeler, uh, where we also can listen to the system through an oralization unit. And that has been compared for so many years, and we have we have we are pretty good at doing the speaker files as good as they can possibly be. That means that the simulation from that on is say easy, but it, uh, it it matches real well. So the answer to that question is yes. Uh, if you could place them correctly, they will be incredibly close. Good. That's good to hear. Thank you. More questions, Dave? 
Yes, I just have a, uh, a question from Nitesh. Uh, could you please share the East Focus session files with us? Is that possible, Jurgen? Sure. Um, could you guys share my email or how, how would you yeah, well, do that? Yeah, so we, we could. Oh, can we go live back again? So big marker is failing now? Yeah. Okay, um, just let's continue with the questions that we have here, uh, Jurgen. So we have one additional question from um, uh, from Ritesh as well. Uh, where can we? Where can I find the East Focus DLL files for uh, Bose uh, Showmatch? So that is on our website, uh, product.bose.com, um, and you just click for the speaker. And we have, what I say, half. Well, a, a big chunk of the speakers that we are producing, they are in a GLL format. Um, if there is, if there isn't, you can't find it. So if you can find it, it is on our own web page. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's, it's downloadable, right? Yes. Yes. So, um, okay. Then we will, I will make sure, uh, Jurgen, if you share us the, um, the East Focus uh, design, uh, we will uh, make sure it, it we make it available for the yeah. attendees in this webinar. So that's, we will take care of that. Uh, before we really end this webinar, I also would like to mention that in the handout section, there is a, um, there are two documents available, so they're free for to download. Uh, so please, please take a look there, um, as they might be useful as well. Yeah. Okay. I think we're there. Yes. Sorry for the glitch. <laughs> yes, I'm, uh, our apologies for that. Well, it's live, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry for that. Things can happen. Um, I think we're good to go. If you have any questions, feel free, uh, send us an email and we will, well, we are happy to help you with your questions. Yeah. And Jurgen, I would like to thank you a lot for attending uh, this webinar. Thank you. Being with us. You. And uh, we hope to see you next week. Uh, next week we have uh, the STI webinar. So really interesting with our colleague uh, Thomas in Germany. So hope to see you there. Stay safe. Bye bye.